Hello and welcome to this Society of Teachers of Family Medicine webinar on mentoring medical students through the imposter phenomenon. My name is Emily Walters and I'll be facilitating today's webinar based on one of the most popular sessions at the 2020 STFM Conference on Medical Student Education. Our panelists today are Dr. David C. Bury, Dr. Colin Sheffield, and Dr. Scott P. Grogan. The 2021 Virtual Conference on Medical Student Education will be on February 1st through 3rd, and you can register today at stfm.org slash MSE. With that, I'll turn it over to our panelists for today's presentation. Hey, thank you, Emily, and welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we are so excited to be sharing our talk on mentoring medical students through the imposter phenomenon. The imposter phenomenon or the imposter syndrome, we've all heard of it and likely experienced it ourselves, that sense of feeling like a fraud, undeserving of your accomplishments, or somehow that you have fooled people into thinking that you are better than you actually are. It's a concept that was first described over 40 years ago and is pervasive in business, technology, healthcare, and of course, medical education. In medical schools and residencies, we have seen this contributing to burnout, low self-esteem, exhaustion. So what do we collectively do to combat this phenomenon? Today, we're going to explore this. I'm delighted to be joined by two of my esteemed colleagues and fellow imposters, Dr. Colin Sheffield and Dr. Scott Grogan. Dr. Sheffield and I presented this topic at the 2020 STFM Conference on Medical Student Education in Portland. We're grateful to have been invited back uh, to present again. If you joined us last year, we have taken some of your feedback and added a few new studies and also a big section on self-efficacy. We hope you take some of the concepts that we discussed today back to your institution so we can best help medical students, residents, and ourselves be the best we can be. With that, I'd like to pass it over to my colleagues for a brief introduction. Dr. Sheffield. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being a part of this conversation. Uh, I'm Colin Sheffield. I'm a third year resident. Um, and I did exactly what Dr. Beery the last time uh, presented this. And I felt just very empowered after that conversation. And I'm glad that I get to do it again. Everyone, my name is Scott Grogan. I am uh... I'm currently an ultrasound fellow after spending four years and three months as a residency director at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. I have a long career in, edu in medical education, and um, in particular, this topic has always been one of my, uh, my, the one I'm the most passionate about in terms of the, the amount of effort that I've given towards it in my uh, presentation career. So very happy to be with you again today and uh, and joining this team to discuss this important topic. Thank you, gentlemen. And lastly, I'm David Bury, a family physician and director of the Family Medicine Residency Program at Martin Army Community Hospital here at, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Go to the next slide, please, Emily. Our disclosure today is that all opinions and assertions uh, made by us do not reflect the official views of the US Army Medical Department, the Army at large, or the DOD. Next slide. As we get started, we'd like to take a quick poll of the audience. This will also give us the opportunity to uh, familiarize yourself with the Zoom polling if you're not used to this platform. We'd like to know who we have in the audience today. And we know that tackling IP is such a huge endeavor and requires contributions from all the cohorts that we see on this list. So hopefully they're well represented here. Um, Emily, we'll go ahead and launch the poll. All right, so I can see the results. Hopefully you can too. So um, we've got a great mix. So this, this is wonderful. So half of you all are undergraduate medical education faculty. So thanks so much for joining us. I think this is so important. Um, you know, we've got a couple of residents or fellows. So thanks for joining us, uh, graduate medical education faculty, and then uh, two administrators or coordinators. And then I saw some comments pop up on the chat that we've got some other folks too. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry we didn't put you on the slide, but uh, Again, we appreciate your uh, collaboration um, as we move forward on this topic. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sheffield for the next slide. Perfect, thanks Dr. Beery, I appreciate it. 
So the slide that I would love to just kind of chat about is when have you felt a sense of inadequacy, self-doubt, or a sense of fraudulence despite your success? I know that in my first couple of years of residency and even going into my third year, despite having done a large portion of research on this topic, presented on this topic, that this is something that has challenged me, that maybe at some point my luck would run out and my attendings would see that maybe they asked the right question or the patient asked the right question and they find out that I'm a fraud and maybe I'm not uh, the position they thought or I was and shouldn't be responsible for their care. I think if that's something that you felt, you'd actually be part of a growing majority of us um, who have had similar types of feelings. I think with a shift in perspective and a few more tools in our tool belt, however, we can kind of overcome this imposter phenomenon in ourselves and others to find confidence and better live up to our full potential. I believe the imposter phenomenon is a personal struggle with inadequacy, self-doubt, and a sense of fraudulence despite our success. Those who suffer from this may feel underqualified and incompetent, uh, often having trouble internalizing uh, their own accomplishments. However, though, the important part is that this does not necessarily involve struggles with self-esteem or confidence. So success and achievement are in independent of the imposter phenomenon. The imposter phenomenon affects high-performing individuals, those with ambitious careers, terminal degrees, and frequent promotions. Uh, next slide, please. I think this graphic is a great representation of who we feel uh, imposter phenomenon affects. We have green, which is people who get imposter uh, phenomenon, orange, who is other people who get imposter phenomenon, and then blue is literally everyone. They also get imposter phenomenon. Everyone feels like an imposter sometimes, and we're hoping at the end of this presentation that we realize that that's an okay feeling. Next slide. Our objectives for this presentation are to apply imposter phenomenon evidence to medical student mentorship, build skills, implement techniques as mentors to lead students through feelings of self-doubt and fraud, formulate a plan to create a safe learning environment in your institution that stifles imposter phenomenon and produces confident students, and then practice self-efficacy skills and demonstrate this to learners. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Burry to talk about it more. Thanks, Dr. Sheffield. Uh, on the next slide, so let's talk about the imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome as we as we see it described often in the literature. So uh, I want to go back to kind of the origin, then we'll talk about the evidence and then the potential impact that could have on us and our learners and our institutions. So in 1978, doctors Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes interviewed 150 successful, intelligent, and high-achieving women. Despite their external successes, however, these women chalk their successes up to luck. They lack the internal validation and that sense of, of personal accomplishment, Clance and I found. This pattern of self-doubt and poor self-worth and fear of being exposed as, as fraudulent was described in their article, The Imposter Phenomenon in High-Achieving Women, Dynamics and Therapeutic Intervention. Later research on this subject reveals that the imposter phenomenon is equally prevalent in men, and perhaps even more so in people of color. This phenomenon has also been described across multiple fields, including academics, business, healthcare, and education. In some iterations of this talk in the past, we've had participants complete the Clance IP scale, which is available through Dr. Clance's website free of charge. Doctors uh, Clance and Imes are pictured here on the slide as well. Uh, together, these two ladies speculated that various factors contribute to the development of IP, now, the roles of gender and family and social culture really play some key roles. It's further been studied and thought that uh, it could be rooted in labels attached by parents in childhood. For example, you may have grown up as the smart one or the shy one, uh, or if you're a millennial like me who grew up in the every child gets a trophy era, always being made to feel like a star performer may have imparted a sense of superiority that can be hard to overcome in the future. This may bleed into adulthood and manifest as perfectionism or the reliance on others for praise and esteem when our own self-worth just doesn't measure up. Let's talk through how this be can become a vicious cycle on the next slide. So as defined by Clance, we're gonna take a look at the imposter cycle. So this begins with a project or piece of work, an achievement related task. So let's say that you're working with a resident uh, and you ask them to give a lecture or you ask a medical student to present a morning report, immediately the response may be anxiety or self-doubt and worry. And then one will respond either by over-preparation 
or by procrastination. And then the lecture's done, the accomplishment is achieved, and there's this feeling of relief, followed by positive feedback. However, the over-preparer views a successful outcome as a result that was only due to effort. I was only successful because I put so much time into this lecture. The procrastinator views a successful outcome as, well, I guess I got lucky. Neither one of them really views the success as a result of their own personal ability. So they start to ignore and push away that positive feedback. This in turn leads to feeling like a fake, self-doubt, et cetera, which perpetuates the cycle for each project or piece of work in the future. So it's really easy to see how we can get sucked into the cycle. And let's take a look at some of the evidence. Next slide, please. This pilot study by Vilwak uh, and her team sought to describe levels of burnout and the imposter syndrome in medical students, as well as to recognize demographic differences in those experiencing both burnout and, and the imposter syndrome. This survey of 138 medical students showed uh, prevalence in nearly half of the female medical students and a quarter of the male medical students. It was also significantly associated with the burnout components of exhaustion and cynicism, emotional exhaustion, and depersonalization. The fourth year of medical school was also significantly associated with imposter syndrome. So these associations with, with burnout are really alarming, right? In addition to our other efforts, maybe talking about IP can be critical to improving our efforts towards a culture of wellness. Next slide. A 2020 study describes uh, uh, one um, residency program's approach to kind of tackling this. This described a facilitator-guided interactive discussion for internal medicine residents on the topic of imposter syndrome, which was part of a larger series of discussions on resident wellness. Uh, this was a 30 to 45 minute session that was led by a psychologist or chief resident. 21 residents participated and were surveyed at the end of these uh, small discussions and 96% felt comfortable recognizing imposter syndrome in themselves, and 62% knew the appropriate next steps after identifying this. I found the resident responses on the table on the right to be particularly enjoyable, um, citing the helpfulness of small group discussion format, and also recommendations to keep the sessions brief, uh, provide food, and one resident even considered the addition of puppies for pet therapy. Next slide. So let's take a poll. I'm, I'm curious, what factors or experiences are present in your institution that may be related to the imposter phenomenon? I want you to choose all of these uh, that apply. So you can go ahead and, and launch the poll, Emily, if you haven't. And I want you to kind of take a minute to read these and, and check off the ones that, that may apply to you. Some may be positive, some may be negative. And really, I think that just by sharing um, kind of where we are with, with one another it helps to normalize this feeling, right? Uh, imposter phenomenon is common, it's pervasive. So maybe the first step for, for all of us is just kind of admit that, that we're in the same boat. But um, let's take a look and uh, we'll give you a minute to uh, check the boxes here and then we'll look at the survey results. All right, so um, let's go ahead and close the poll, Emily, and we'll take a look at the results. So hopefully you had a chance to take a look through. Um, like you said, some of those may be kind of contributing factors, other may be a little bit more protective. And wow, we got a lot of uh, participation here, so pretty prevalent. So um, we'll, we'll kind of go through them one by one uh, briefly. So first of all, you know a student resident or faculty who may identify with this, right? Very, very common. The majority of us can relate to this. Low self-esteem is common in learners, we, we know that. Um, I'm glad to see that frequent personal reflection is encouraged. And then look at this, one of the 89% the, uh, of you said that there's a pervasive desire for perfectionism, right? And in this, this culture of medicine where we have top performers doing you know, high stress, high risk jobs, right? We, we have this demand to be perfect. And, and I, I think that that can be a contributing factor towards IP. Maybe there's some uh, disparities in the learning experience by gender. Um, accomplishments are celebrated. Only 32% are saying that we celebrate the accomplishments of others. Um, asking for help is seen as a sign of weakness in more than half of us. Uh, active mentorship, uh, more than half. So um, I, I think that that's, that's really good to see that a lot of us can kind of relate to some of these factors. So 
Um, let's take a look at the evidence on the next slide, please, Emily. So this last poll really was designed in response to this recent review, uh, which examined 18 different studies on the imposter syndrome. Contributing factors uh, that they identified included a female gender, so more females identified with this. Um, maybe there's this uh, component of bias there. Um, students and residents with low self-esteem, uh, the sense of perfectionism and asking for sign of help or asking for help as a sign of weakness are all contributing factors, right? All associated with imposter phenomenon. Now, protective factors. So there was only a few studies that really looked at this and um, protective factors that help us uh, prevent um, imposter phenomenon, personal reflection, right? Keeping a record of successes, uh, celebrating accomplishments, seeking out mentorship, and then workshops on the imposter syndrome. So I think really we can take these and kind of look at, at where we are in our own institution and maybe find things that we should be sustaining or maybe some uh, new techniques to try. So next slide, please. As we kind of wrap up this, this evidence, and there's so many studies out there, this was just a, a couple that stood out to us. Um, really, we wanna take a look at, at the impact, right? This phenomenon that's been around for over four decades with lots of evidence, um, you know, we think that there's a huge impact on medical education. Among other conclusions, we know that the imposter phenomenon symptoms peak in the clinical years and during big transitions. So think about the medical students that are going from you know, classroom work to clinical rotations, right? Big change, um, beginning internship, right? Coming from different medical schools and starting internship, or even graduating from being your, your intern up to a second year resident, right? These are big transitions that uh, really imposter phenomenon can be highly present. So what we think is that these are also prime opportunities to, to intervene, right? And if we don't intervene, we're setting up students and residents, right? The doctors of tomorrow to feel inadequate, unworthy, and ill-prepared. So couldn't we then find ways to help mentor these students and residents? Can we instead build learners who are confident, well, and capable? I would argue that yes, we absolutely can. So let's talk about how to do that. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Sheffield. Perfect, thanks Dr. Beery. So I think as mentors, uh, especially in my role as a peer mentor, and then working fairly close with my jun you know, junior residents as well as medical students, is that uh, I feel I have a key component in this. And so it was important for us to try to uh, identify ways that we can uh, make change in this. So identifying imposter, as Dr. Beery kind of mentioned with the, the cycle that's pretty consistent uh, with the achievement related tasks, uh, as I can also then relate to this, especially in relation to the, just this uh, conversation in this presentation where maybe there's some over preparation or procrastination and then how that impacted my overall ability to feel comfortable with this. And then, you know, changing my uh, idea of self-doubt as well of, you know, maybe it was my two mentors who are with me today, Dr. Beery and Dr. Grogan. Uh, maybe they aren't solely responsible for this being a good talk, although they probably have a large part to do with it. So uh, identifying this imposter and then figuring out how number two would be to change the culture. So how do we uh, help these individuals? And then developing skills to normalize, challenge, and then affirm on this. Next slide, please. So we've identified some characteristics on the presentation of an imposter. So avoidant behavior, those who avoid the labor and delivery deck because they're worried about their skills and then uh, being maybe exposed as a fraud or the incapable of doing these things. Also those with academic challenges and cognitive performance on ITEs, uh, board examinations, shelf examinations, those things where uh, there's some competition against their colleagues. Uh, and then professionalism issues, so poor time management, charting difficulties, poorly rated patient interactions, and then poor perceptions by colleagues. But I think it, this part might be important to remember that we're here to teach and to mentor, not there to diagnose and treat our residents as patients. So they have, residents have different uh, medical students, different and varying personality types, traits and upbringings that we're unlikely to change. If we feel maybe that this resident would benefit from additional support, I think that's a perfectly appropriate time to offer formal psychological evaluations and support to really help that individual through this. Next slide. So I'd love to do an audience poll that's kind of uh, what I have maybe seen at my institution, but I speculate that COVID-19 and the pandemic and 
as much as it's changed, sometimes a uh, virtual learning is that has caused a drastic increase in imposters. Perhaps this is due to shifting learning environments to a decentralized or virtual environment, which may increase anxiety and contribute to over preparation or procrastination. So I'd love to know and COVID-19 increased uh, in your institution. So I can just give a personal example of things that I feel like I've seen is that uh, in the fourth year medical students as they rotated through and then the new interns uh, and having a lot of them at either the new interns at the end of their fourth year and then as well as these third year and fourth year medical students who've had a large majority of their clinical education moved to a, a you know, decentralized or home-based learning that when they get to the institution and they're participating in these clinical encounters, they have this imposter phenomenon, mostly because they're worried that their education is somehow uh, less, uh, uh, less efficient or less, uh, you know, is not as good as their colleagues or who had a normal kind of third and fourth year clinicals. And so I, I appreciate the response to this. And, possibly a majority of you that there might be seen in, as an increase in that. Um, and that's something that I feel like I've seen in my institution as well. So next slide, please. And then number two, we're talking about changing the culture. And so I think in medical education, we have to be vigilant for signs of imposter syndrome or phenomenon in learners. I believe that self-doubt, self-criticism and disengagement can be fatal for these learners because now they're disengaged or they're not wanting to participate in things that challenge them that can be really crucial to their overall education. And I know that for a lot of us with perfectionism, as we talked about earlier, is that we don't like to acknowledge our mistakes fear of litigation or is there a fear of you know, shame from our peers or that maybe that the residents or that the medical students we're teaching will look down on us or not trust us with their future educational goals. And I think that this is an important characteristic as my two mentors have done with me and that I try to enact with those that I'm, uh, that I'm teaching and mentoring is that these are the things that when I was an intern, I really struggled with or when I was a uh, resident, I, I, these were my mistakes that I made. Uh, similar to the way that my mentors did with me and that this is how I overcame it uh, and got to where I am. It wasn't through just not making mistakes along the way. It was from making those mistakes, growing from those mistakes, and then figuring out how to do better in the future. So I'd love to reflect kind of on shame in medical education. Mostly, how does your institution respond when a student resident makes a mistake? Is that uh, do we shame them? Do we support them? How do we help them move forward and overcome this in the future? And then what should the future culture of medical education look like in ways that we can support these individuals to kind of living up to their full potential? I'll pass it back to Dr. Berry for more. Great. Thanks, Dr. Sheffield. And, and so the last kind of mentorship role that, that we see is so important um, is really applying these mentorship skills, right? And we know that, that mentoring through the imposter phenomenon can be challenging. Uh, w. Brad Johnson and David G. Smith provide several tips. So the first, we must normalize the imposter feelings. Share with residents and colleagues that these feelings are more prevalent than it may seem. Uh, share your own stories like Dr. Sheffield just did. Uh, talk about this. And it's so important. We've also you know, seen research that learners appreciate this, particularly in that kind of small, uh, dis small discussion-based uh, format. Second, we want to challenge negative self-talk, right? And this is something that you can employ right now as soon as we're done with this webinar um, that's immediate and effective. As Johnson and Smith recommend, be vigilant for comments like, I am so stupid, or I totally botched that presentation, or I have no business being in medicine. When you hear these, challenge them with concrete data and try to interrupt the imposter cycle with targeted questions. If somebody says, I am so stupid, say, well, why do you think that way? And then say, it's okay to not know the answers for everything. You know, where would you go to find this information, right? Challenge it immediately and directly. Also, we talked about labels, right? So anyone growing up being the smart one or the adventurous one or even the troublemaker may have trouble overcoming those labels uh, down the road. So as mentors, we really kind of want to dig into learners' backgrounds, perceptions, and experiences to see if that could be playing a role. Always uh, and never. So be on the lookout when you hear these words, always and never, those absolute terms 
which are really rarely true, right? It's, it's hi hyperbole in most cases. And whenever learners talk about themselves by saying, oh, I always screw up or I'll never get it right, uh, it, it really starts to eat away at their psyche and, and contribute to that self-doubt. And third, affirmation is key. We want to counter imposter worries with copious doses of affirmation and encouragement, highlight past accomplishments and review achievements to show to your mentees that yes, they do belong, they should be here, and give credit where credit is due. Imposters will readily give away credit for an accomplishment. Um, be wary of those who consistently give credit to mentors or teammates and downplay their own contributions. I'm looking at you, Dr. Sheffield, great job so far. So we have a responsibility as mentors, really identifying imposters, or better yet, helping imposters to self-identify. Um, we also need to change the culture and then employ the mentorship skills uh, that you can see on your screen. But we also wanna know what else, what are we missing? What else can we do or what else can we teach to go beyond imposter? Dr. Grogan? Oh, sorry there, just needed to find my unmute button. So thank you, Dr. Berry, Dr. Kopp, Dr. Sheffield. So um, I, I'll tell you, I started in this uh, literature searching and really getting into this topic in about 2014 when I was residency faculty and we had a brilliant young intern who was just absolutely uh, beyond her years in potential and just was filled with negative self-talk. And, uh, and everybody in the program saw the, the brilliance that was there. And it was frustrating to see her struggle so much with her and her own thoughts. Um, and so we were, you know, I started diving into some of this literature and trying to help her and mentor her through the process. And, uh, and when she had her light bulb moment and really turned it all around, it was, it was really astounding. And then she did not disappoint. Uh, and, and I love sharing the story when I can tell it in its long form, which I can't do today, unfortunately. Um, so one of the reasons that I, I really got into this is beyond just being inspired by a you know, a resident that I was working with, I really got tired of hearing the same piece of terrible advice given to people who look like they were not very confident in themselves, which I'm sure you have all heard or even said at some point in response to, to, to a request for feedback is, you know, you just got to be more confident. And it's really a hit to somebody's confidence when they hear that. It is not a practical tip and there's no way helpful to them. So please, I urge you, don't use that phrase. And when you hear somebody use it, you should ask them with a follow-up question is, can you give me practical tips on how I can do that? And that's what we're gonna do in this next section. So can you go ahead, Emily? So by the end of this section, I'm gonna at least convince you to do these few things, few little take-home tips that you can take that work on your own self-efficacy and you can mentor your students through their self-efficacy, which is power pose for two minutes by yourself and then with a student. I want you to open your body posture during your encounters with other people, not just with your residents and students, but also with your patients. Try it with your family members, right? It's great. It helps everything. Um, practice reflection. And really, this is about telling your story to yourself. Uh, we're going to get into the details of that. And then be prepared to disappoint and then learn from it. And that's okay. And the last thing I'm going to introduce this concept of the confidence prescription that you can prescribe to your students and residents. All right, let's go ahead. So first things first, let's define self-efficacy. Uh, Albert Bandura kind of popularized this back in 1995. This is about when Daniel Goleman was popularizing the emotional intelligence concepts. And that is uh, defined it as the belief in one's capabilities to organize and execute a course of action required to manage prospective situations. So something in the future that I have the confidence that I know when I face a code situation, I'm not going to panic and run out crying, um, that I'm going to be able to do this and perform in the moment when it's required of me. Okay, let's move forward. So in order to get into the, uh, the understanding some of the some of our actual behaviors, we need to get back into the origins and the neurobiology of, of the brain development. So we're going to start with uh, some of these concepts you probably have seen before. Uh, I really enjoy John Medina, the neuro, neuroscientist at the University of Washington, and his description of this, the, uh, the primitive and reptilian brain, which you know, really refers to the kind of basal ganglia and those areas of the brain that are most responsible for uh, the, the simple functions, right? So these are not just fight or flight, but territoriality and um, uh, 
you know, mating rituals, for example. So aggression, dominance, um, that all go along with that. So let's move forward. So as, as you know, there's lots of examples in the animal kingdom out there of when animals are challenged or when you know, simple brained animals are challenged, what do they do in response to that? So if you take the nice puffer fish and you challenge it, it, even if it can't actually fight off, it can make itself look like it can fight off. So it makes itself look very dominant and very big all of a sudden to look scarier and scare off its opponents um, trying to, to um, enhance its own testosterone, if you will. Uh, so let's move forward. Likewise, mating rituals. So if we want to make ourselves look dominant and make ourselves look confident and make it look like we're somebody that you want to procreate with, we're going to make ourselves look bigger. So peacock is a great example of this, but you can see this all through the animal kingdom, trying to attract mates, uh, animals will make themselves look bigger. It's not, let's move forward. It's not entirely, uh, just for animals though, we are for simple animals, we do this too, right? So I love this picture of Cam Newton because these were taken from the same two seasons, right? So he scores a touchdown and what does he do in response to, to a challenge and rises to the challenge and he's successful? He makes himself big, he hands up in the air and I'm number one, I'm the best. And think about the last time you did that. Last time I did that was a week ago. I happened to be up skiing uh, the night after a 16 inch dump of snow and I got first tracks down in a backcountry bowl all by myself and what did I do? Arms up, screaming at the top of my lungs was my natural response because I felt very powerful and very free in the moment. And likewise, on the opposite of that, when we feel very defeated, so Cam Newton, again, being defeated in the playoffs, this was at his post-game press conference. And what does he do? He makes himself look closed after defeat. I don't, you know, I'm going to close my posture. I feel very low. I feel very weak. And so I'm going to make myself small and look meek um, by comparison. So let's move forward. So where's the neuroendocrine basis of some of these behaviors? So even though it's a very complicated system, I really just want to talk about two hormones. So that is testosterone and cortisol. In general, testosterone is going to rise in response to a challenge or in response to victory. So if you basically, if you feel more powerful, your testosterone level will rise. If you feel um, more, um, I should say, if, if you feel in a powerful position, on top of it, your cortisol level will remain fairly low unless you are acutely stressed. So while cortisol has a very adaptive response for short term, so fight or flight response, it is very bad if you are chronically stressed. So people who are chronically stressed and feel chronically um, like they are underperforming or they're unable to perform, there's actually quite a maladaptive response to having chronically elevated cortisol levels. On top of it, those the higher the cortisol level at baseline, usually the lower the testosterone. And this goes for men and women, right? We all have some level of testosterone. Um, and when you have that chronic maladaptive response with elevated cortisol, this can lead to chronic health problems in addition to uh, in addition to the behavioral implications of it being chronically elevated. So then this begs the question, is there an association between the posture that we're maintaining on a you know, moment to moment basis and these um, neuroendocrine uh, or th these endocrine markers? Uh, so let's move on. And so we're gonna get into that. There's a couple studies that I want to, uh, several studies that I want to highlight. Um, these were uh, kind of again popularized through uh, some scientific research or psychology re researchers at Harvard. Um, and what they did was, was have participants come in and they had them uh, placed in positions of either high power or low power. So I've given you some examples of what that might look like. And so think about the moments when you feel really good and you feel really powerful. Maybe your head, your hands are back behind your head and your feet are kicked up on the desk. Or maybe you're standing at the end of a, of a, um, a conference room table and you're, you're leading a discussion and you feel very powerful as opposed to you just lost the playoffs or somebody is yelling at you or berating you for something and you're going to sit in this closed, uh, closed uh, averted position. And so what they did is they asked participants to do this for two minutes, to hold these poses for two minutes, one or the other, and then they measured uh, levels of cortisol, salivary cortisol, and they measured testosterone. They also um, put them through an exercise where they basically had to, uh, to act. They, they gave them 
I said at the end of the study, you can have $2 and walk away, or you can roll this dice and you can get $4 potentially with a, a one to two chance of actually getting it. And so people who did the high power poses, not only did their testosterone go up, their cortisol went down, and they were more likely to act. So 83% of participants um, chose to roll the dice as opposed to only 60% who who held the low power poses. Let's move on. So graphically, you can see that. Is he, oh, go back, yep, thank you. So graphically, you can see that. So looking on the left side, these are uh, the left side of each of those diagrams is people who held the, the high power poses. So the left side is testosterone, the right graph is cortisol. So as I said, there's often an inverse relationship. The higher the testosterone at base, baseline, usually the lower the cortisol, but, um, indicating a better handling of response to a stressful situation. Move forward. All right, go ahead. So there was, uh, there's some additional studies that were done looking at this exact same thing uh, by similar, a similar research team. They had people put into an expansive pose or a contracted pose for two minutes. And then they had them put, they put them through a series of cognitive processing and abstraction tests. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, and then likewise, they had them also put in positions of uh, high power and low power. So they basically would say, all right, uh, Dr. Sheffield, you are going to be in the position of manager, and Dr. Beery, you're going to be in the position of employee, uh, and, and th does that have a, an influence as well? And it turns out that it does have influence, but not nearly as much influence as the, the poses that people hold. On top of it, when they looked at those cognitive per, uh, performance and abstraction scores, were better in people who actually held the powerful pose for two minutes before they did the exercises. So again, going back to this likelihood to act or not act. So people who were uh, held the high power pose, 81% of them chose to act in response to a similar challenge that we described previously versus 58% in the low power pose. So my take home from this is, go ahead, Emily, is I want you to try to do a power pose for two minutes if, uh, you know, when we wanna uh, try to attack one of those elements for, for improving self-efficacy. So let's move forward. So right now, we're gonna do it. So I want all of you in your safety of your own home or your workplace in your office with the door closed, we can't see you, but we're, we're gonna challenge you to actually stand up and think about what kind of pose would feel very powerful to you. And then I actually want you to do it for two minutes. So I'm gonna start a timer here and we're just gonna go for two minutes. And personally, I like, the Captain Morgan. So I'm just going to stand here in the Captain Morgan pose. Dr. Beery is standing there with his hands on his hips. I'm not sure what Dr. Sheffield is going to do. But when we've done this at regional workshops in the past, we've had the entire room of, you know, 70 or 80 people all standing around doing different poses. And it is a whole lot of fun to see how creative people can be as they do this. So we certainly have seen hands behind the head and feet up on the desk, people doing, uh, doing the hands on the hips, the hands on the table. Uh, anything that they can, even if it's hands up in the air and make yourself look really big and just hold this position for a couple minutes. Two minutes actually feels like quite a long time um, when you're standing there doing this, but almost like, think about it like a meditation. So if I want to do a calming meditation for 30 seconds before I walk into a patient's room where I'm anticipating a difficult encounter, but 30 seconds feels like a long time, but it's actually really important for your, uh, for the expected improvement in in this case, in cognitive performance and my ability to handle stress in the moment when I'm faced with it. Dr. Beery, do you have a favorite pose? You know, this is one of them right now, Dr. Gray. I think hands on the hips. And, you know, I, I was standing at my, my standing desk just to give this presentation. So all I had to do is take a couple steps back because you know, even just standing for this talk, uh, you know, I think gives me more more confidence uh, to have that body posture as we speak. And then, you know, the other one I think would just be sitting down on the couch with with my legs crossed, so which is a little bit more inviting, but still makes me uh, me feel confident and um, you know powerful. That is outstanding. Thank you for sharing. All right, we are just coming up on two minutes right now, so we're going to go ahead and stop this exercise. And Emily, can you reshare the slides? Thank you all for participating. I hope you had fun with that. So let's move forward. And I'm so glad that you talked about your uh, inviting body position, because that's the next thing we're going to talk about, which is perception of nonverbal cues. 
So I want to talk about this study that I found to be totally fascinating, and I'm sure we can all relate to this. So essentially, this was a group of participants who, um, who were asked to observe actors in a room that were basically looking in on an exam room. So imagine you're examining, this doctor and patient are in a room, and there's four groups. So the first is averted gaze and posture. So if Dr. Beery is my patient and I really am not interested in him, I'm gonna look over this way at maybe at my computer screen and I'm not gonna look at him. I'm just gonna be typing away. Tell me about your problems. Okay, okay, okay. Patient's over here and I'm just typing away on my computer. I'm kind of averting my gaze and I'm averting my posture in a closed manner. Then they did the various adaptations of that. So can I at least, maybe I have a little bit of an avoidant posture, but I'm at least looking at him and taking notes versus I have an open posture, but looking away versus open posture and engaging face-to-face -face with my patient. They had outside observers score those encounters without hearing any audio. So they turned all the audio off and just had them look at the body position and the interaction between those people and judge the empathy on this scale of one to five of those providers. And so you can see the difference in score there. So if I had an averted gaze and posture, my perception of empathy from an outside observer who can't hear what I'm saying is a 2.1 versus a 4.8 if they can see that I'm facing, engaging, and uh, I seem to have an open posture and engaging with my patient. None of this is shocking to us who do this on a regular basis. But we often forget, right? We get stressed in the moment and we turn away from our patients. We turn away from our residents or our students or those people that we're mentoring. When really we should put, put ourselves into an inviting open posture position to help people um, actually believe that we have more empathy for them. <clears throat> so secondly, I love this soccer study that, um, that, was, uh, that I first learned about when I read Amy Cuddy's book on, on uh, presence. And this talks about 359 soccer players in the uh, World Cup and in the, the Champions League in Europe. Uh, so 359 goal kicks. And they basically had, again, researchers looked at who had an avoidant posture and gaze before they took their goal kick versus who, had, who stood up with an open posture, who engaged visibly with the goalie before they took their shot. And what they found was that those people who had avoidant postures, those players who looked down at the ground, looked to side to side, shoulders slumped over, had a significantly greater likelihood of missing the shot compared to those who engaged with the, the goalie um, and had open body posture. Next slide. So what we have established here is that closed and averted nonverbal cues worsen perception of performance by outside observers and actually limit your performance. Next. So what my recommendation to you is open, use open nonverbal cues that actually include, you know, in, sorry, improve your perception and your performance. Last one. And so again, I can't say for sure that that translates to improved staff, peer and patient perception of you, but uh, it's hard to argue with the points that, uh, that have been found in, in this literature. And just based on my own anecdotal experience over my career, I would say all those things seem to ring true to me. Next slide. Okay, the next study I wanna talk about is not a body language study, but this is a self-reflection and self-affirmation study. I really like this one, so much so that I had all of our residents do this when I was, uh, when I was the residency director every year. When they would first start with residency, I would have them pull out, uh, we would do a list of, uh, values, I would have them circle a bunch and then I would have them pick the top nine, I would circle the top nine that, for them, and then they would choose the top two of those and then write themselves a little story, because that's what this research study did. They had students um, who uh, would, again, take their top nine values and then pick two of those and then use them to answer the question, when did these values help you through a difficult situation. And they would write a little narrative out to, to remind them of the stories of when these things actually helped them and how they got through tough times. And so what they found from this is again, looking at uh, salivary cortisol levels like we did previously, you can see the, the those who had 
elevated levels of cortisol were in the control group, and those who had lower levels of cortisol were in the value affirmation group in response to a stress test. What was that stress test, you ask? Well, it's called the Trier uh, Social Stress Test, and it is an absolute nightmare for those of you with social anxiety. So essentially, it is a five-minute impromptu speech in front of a panel of, of people who are trained to give you zero feedback. They just sit there. They don't say anything. They don't look at you. They don't blink. They don't do anything. They don't smile or frown. You just have to give this impromptu speech. And then right after that, you have to count backwards by sevens from 2083 while the whole panel yells at you, faster, faster, faster. And then how, and, and you have to perform for that. So again, a nightmare for people with social anxiety um, and people who did self-reformation did better. Next slide. So, um, yep, that's fine. All right, so really what I wanna drive home with this is that self-affirmation works, but you have to take some time to do a value-based exercise. And you need to do this and not just for yourself, but for the students that you're working with. Um, and they really have to tell your story to yourself. So this is taking your values and then telling you, reminding yourself of when they've taken you through a hard time. Next one. Okay, so we got a few minutes here to do this uh, last exercise, which is um, we're not gonna have you do the entire exercise because that would take you probably half an hour, but we're at least gonna introduce the concept. So we're gonna just put up a slide of various values. It's not comprehensive, but it's something. Um, to just, I want you to look at them, pull out a pencil, paper, pull out your iPhone, whatever it is that you're going to do. And I want you to pick the nine values off of this screen or other ones that are meaningful to you, and then just record those. After this session is over, what I would ask you to do is to take the time to pick the top two of those and write a little reflection for yourself of when those values have carried you through the hard time. All right, let's go ahead. So we got three minutes. Dr. Brewery. Would you please give an example as people are picking out the values that they might choose? Uh, can you tell us an example of a story when one of your top values carried you through a hard time? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Greg. And I, I enjoyed doing this exercise. I think it's it's so valuable as as an imposter and and also as a mentor. And um, you know, difficult to to kind of narrow this list down um, to to core values. Um, but the ones that I, I kind of came up with were compassion, uh, respect, and humility, those three. And I think as a relatively new program director, there have been many kind of challenges that I've faced where I felt either unprepared or really unworthy of the, the responsibility to make those decisions. And, you know, I recall making a, a challenging decision to remove a learner uh, from the learning environment so that they could seek uh, some much needed medical care. And, it was a very tough decision um, to, to take a learner out of out of that academic setting. And, you know, one that that I reflect back on often and ask myself if I did the right thing or acted the right way or uh, performed in the manner of which I, I should have. But, you know, then I look at my core values and I say, well, you know, I use compassion to kind of care for this person's unique needs. Uh, you know, I used respect uh, when handling you know, their private concerns uh, in a very a non-private setting of a, of a busy residency program. And then also the, the personal humility uh, to ask my mentor for advice when I wasn't exactly sure what to do. So, you know, reflecting back on these for me has has been beneficial and hopefully by, by sharing with others, it helps to normalize uh, this feeling. And, you know, those of you that are listening, if, if you were involved mm -hmm. with me in this particular incident, maybe even giving me kind of, uh, you know, feedback as well can um, kind of help move forward and, and prevent that imposter cycle from taking over. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. Uh, certainly I think those of us in academic leadership have found ourselves in a similar situation. Um, and, and then undoubtedly anybody who's been a program director or will be a program director will most likely find themselves in a similar situation. Um, you know, and, and it's not just something to read, you know, for students, it's not just something that ends when you're a medical student or ends when you're an intern or ends when you're a resident or ends when you're a faculty. This keeps going. The, the more leadership you take on, the more difficult challenges you're going to be faced with. And you may wonder at some point, they're going to discover me. Again, as uh, going back to the study that Dr. Beery quoted at the beginning of this, uh, looking at very successful women uh, and, and their propensity to feel like an imposter. So this is wrapping up right about, we're, we're pretty close to three minutes here. So why don't we go ahead and, and move on again. I challenge all of you to come back and come back to this exercise afterwards. And you can find lists of values if you don't know um, 
or you know, ask ask one of your colleagues to find one. Or I just did a Google search for this and then adapted it slightly. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Okay. So the last concepts here, you can just go ahead and get all these. Uh, I think we'll click one or two more times here. That's fine. So um, I, I want to do both of these concepts together, which is uh, self kindness, reflection, and growth. And and really, we're going to go back to what was, you know, we've discussed already earlier in this talk, which is. Um, normalization of these feelings is really important as a mentor and even just for yourself, recognizing that feeling that way is a normal concept. And it's very difficult if you're always so hard on yourself after every, after every performance or even before a performance. So if you don't have some ability to act kindly towards yourself, it's very difficult to then reflect back on those processes and grow from them. And really, as in, in academic medicine, this was always one of the things I harped on with people that I was interviewing for residency. And Dr. Sheffield can speak to that because I asked him these questions during his interview. So um, one of the things that I, I've adopted in the past few years now is really this, this concept that I'm going to say I kind of adapted and lifted from, uh, from the, the little gem of a book called the Underachievers Manifesto, which is written by a fellow physician out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, and really, he talks about being prepared to disappoint other people and then learn from it. Basically, if you're not disappointing somebody in your life, you're doing things wrong. Because it's very difficult to, to reflect and grow from an experience if you're not disappointing on some level. And you just have to be okay with that. So again, part of that from a mentorship perspective is normalizing those feelings, promoting self-kindness so that people can reflect and grow from that. And so it's okay. You can tell people ahead of time, you're going to disappoint somebody, right? Yourself in some way, or maybe your mom or your dad, your sister, your friends. Um, but that's okay because you can reflect and learn from it. And the last thing I would encourage you to do as mentors is to try the confidence prescription. I used to have one of these uh, on digital and I tried to share it and I just could not find it for this session. So um, this is just an example and I actually had people do this. So previous sessions, I've, I've handed them out in the audience and had people write them out for themselves and have them write them out for other people. And it always filled me with joy when I'd walk around the hospital and I'd walk into people's offices and I would see it pinned above their desk. It made me smile. So. Um, it's not just a gimmick, it's actually something that, that I found over years that people actually do and, and keep above their desks for, the, for themselves. So try it with your students and your residents um, or with your family members. All right, let's move on. So uh, again, in, people want the practical tips. So you can't just say, be more confident. You can say, be more confident and let me tell you some tips how you can do that. So going back to the mentorship tips that, that Dr. Berry shared before, and then these things that I said we would do during this section, which is power pose for two minutes with yourself and a student, open your body posture during encounters, tell your story to yourself to self-reflect, be prepared to disappoint and learn, and think about the confidence prescriptions. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And I do remember that exact conversation during our interview. So it is something that uh, kind of stays with you, uh, especially as you hit those hard times of trying to re being able to reflect on things that are important. So the biggest thing is bringing it home, making an impact in your institution. Next slide, please. So making an impact at your institution is, first of all, introducing the concept of imposter phenomenon and how that can affect other individuals. And then assessing the culture. Is it something that you see uh, pervasive in others? Is your uh, institution open to recognizing this and then helping others be able to kind of overcome this? Identifying these potential imp imposters based on the kind of uh, self tips that we gave you, as well as the behaviors sometimes that are characteristic of this. And then as well as looking into the imposter cycle and seeing if anyone kind of fits those categories fairly well. And then through guided mentorship and self-efficacy, helping these people kind of live up to their full potential. And then rounding it back out with follow-up and then assessing for culture change. And then you can always start back at the beginning to see if there's ways that you can improve on this to kind of further uh, make impacts at your institution. All right, next slide, please. And then closing points for us. So I believe that we applied imposter phenomenon evidence to medical student mentorship, especially how that impacts medical students, residents, um, and then moving forward as well. We built skills and implemented techniques, power pose, uh, self-efficacy, those sorts of things uh, that as mentors to lead students through feelings of self-doubt and fraud. We formulated a plan to create a safe learning environment in your institution that stifles imposter phenomenon and produces confident students. 
and then practice self-efficacy skills and demonstrated this to learners. Dr. Now I'm gonna pass it. No, yes, I'm sir. sorry, if, if I could interrupt, uh, I just wanted to address a question that I, I see in here um, from uh, Suzanne Minor. I'm sorry, I don't know your professional title, but the, the question is any specific activities for uh, shy or introverted folks in, in medicine? So, do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Dr. Sheffield or Dr. Grogan, how to specifically target those introverts like me? Uh, you know, sir, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do find myself uh, as to be uh, fairly introverted myself. And so I do uh, have my own anxiety about these sort of presentations and things. And I think uh, something that has helped me has been uh, specific activities has been uh, having a mentor that has been able to kind of impart these things, help me develop my own individualized, you know, specifically mine was a learning plan uh, that was, here are your accomplishments, here are the things that you've done really well, mm -hmm. here are the things that we can work on together and help you kind of get through those things. And then giving those specific of here is a, you know, a task that something that you have struggled with and these are the ways that I think we could get through this together. So having really that support system that people see the, the, the things that you've done well, uh, and then helping support you through the things that you can really grow as a, you know, as a future physician and leader in my, in my scenario specifically. Yeah, I, I thanks so much. And, you know, I, I'll just say too that a lot of these activities that we do, the power pose is so, um, it's so bold and open. And if you do it in a big room, it can be difficult. But also if you see your colleagues doing it, it's kind of fun. And the core values exercise for me as an introvert, if, you know, it was difficult to know that I'd have to share with, with uh, you know, all of you all. But I also know that this, this culture, the foundation was set that the culture would be uh, supportive of me being a little bit vulnerable and opening up. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's really a multi-pronged approach. It's, it's setting the culture. It's it's pairing the the mentor and the mentee, like Dr. Sheffield said. And then when you do these activities, just you know, being mindful of uh, individual kind of preferences. So, thank you, Dr. Miner, for the question. And uh, Dr. Grogan, I'll turn it over to you for the next slide. Go ahead, Emily. So lastly, I mean, I, Susan, I've, I also have, uh, you know, some thoughts on that, but based on the couple minutes we have left, I want to make sure that we get enough time uh, to, to close out. I, I do just, I would just start with the practical things that we've already discussed and then uh, going back to the, the celebrating successes and mimicking other people's positive behavior. So what did you see somebody else do that you wish you could do? Write that one down on their, their confidence prescription and say, you should try that. You know, next time let's volunteer for a morning report and you should try that. And just get up there and do it, um, and just one thing at a time, right? Uh, to build those skills. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, of these of these three books. So Simon Sinek's Leaders Eat Last is really great, not just for military people, but for anybody who is in leadership. And all of us in medicine are leaders. All of us, right? It's not just a uh, you know a, a cliche. It is really true. Um, Presence by Amy Cuddy. It's uh, it's kind of her book that summarizes a lot of the literature and research done in this particular area. It's a nice read. Uh, and if you wanted to just do the really snapshot of it, I would I would encourage uh, checking out her TED Talk, which is 21 minutes. That's very, very worth your time. I actually prescribe that to people as part of their confidence prescription. I say, you're going to go watch this video and come back and talk to me about it. And then lastly, The Underachievers Manifesto, which is a, a silly little book, and it is, uh, it's 80 pages long. It takes 20 minutes to read and uh, 80 pages of big font, big margins, um, lots of pictures. And so with 20 minutes, uh, with lots of giggles and laughter, uh, just remind us um, how silly we can be sometimes. And then our, our last slide, we just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today, um, whether you're watching live on the webinar or um, you know down the road on the video recording. And uh, please feel free to give us uh, feedback. I promise you we won't ignore or push away positive feedback like uh, like we've, we've asked um, you not to do when we're mentoring against the imposter cycle. We welcome uh, negative feedback too. We're always looking to kind of make this talk better. And really, we just appreciate the opportunity to have, have presented this uh, last year in Portland and, and again today by a webinar. So uh, thank you all to what you do. Thank you, Emily and the STF team, for, STFM team for hosting us. And we look forward to meeting you all at uh, future conferences and events down the road. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I just, um, lots of great tips. Um, I'm sorry we ran out of a little bit of time to do um, Q&A. I definitely would encourage those of you who have maybe specific 
questions, I'm sure you can um, share them with me. Um, we will be sending out an email to all of you who have attended this presentation, as well as those who registered for the event afterward. And that's an easy way for you to get in touch with me and you can get in touch with the presenters that way as well. Um, and we will also, we've recorded this session and we will be posting it at stfm.org slash webinars. We also have a link there to um, a self-reflection exercise that our presenters have been kind enough to share with us. So um, do feel free to check that out there um, at stfm.org slash webinars. So um, thank you all for sharing um, part of your Wednesday with us to learn more about the importance of mitigating the imposter phenomenon with med students, such a critical and important topic. And thank you to our presenters for sharing your expertise today. With that, um, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thank you.